All right. Okay, well, hello everyone and welcome back to the Academy International Journal Club. This is uh, the last session for this year and it's um, our pleasure to have today Dr. Leith Alexander, who's going to present his very recently published paper, Preliminary Evidence, the Ketamine Alters Anterior Singlet Resting State Functional Connectivity in Depressed Individuals. And I'll just pass the baton over to Leith, who's also going to tell us a bit uh, about himself and his work up to now. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Sarah. So uh, hello, everyone. My name is Leith Alexander. I'm currently an academic clinical fellow in translational psychiatry at King's College London. And we carried out this study in collaboration with the National Institute of Mental Health in the United States. And I was interested in how ketamine alters anterior cingulate connectivity in depressed individuals compared to healthy controls, with a, particularly trying to grasp how the different subregions are differentially affected by ketamine. Um, so the paper's just actually recently been published in Translational Psychiatry, and I'll provide a reference at the end as well. So a bit of background, I was told not really to focus on uh, why ketamine, because we all know why ketamine is interesting. It's interesting for many reasons. So what I wanted to focus on actually is why I was interested in particular in the anterior cingulate cortex. Now, what you're seeing here is a medial view of the human prefrontal cortex and highlighted is the um, anterior cingulate cortex. I'm just trying to find a laser pointer, so hopefully you can see that. So highlighted is the anterior cingulate cortex. And here is the corpus callosum, so the bundle of white matter that joins the two hemispheres. And this bit here is known as the um, the genu, or the knee of the corpus of the corpus callosum. And the subregions of the anterior cingulate cortex are defined relative to the genu of the corpus callosum. So we have a dorsal ACC, dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, perigenual, and subgenual. These are kind of generally the three main regions of the ACC. And in colours are the different cytoarchitectonic regions that comprise these subdivisions based on um, one atlas. Uh, these are Brodmann areas. So there's Brodmann area 32 in orange, Brodmann area 24 in green, and Brodmann area 25, which sits quite cordially actually in the subgenual anterior cingulate cortex. So you can see these subdivisions comprise different um, cytoarchitectonic uh, regions, and therefore the anatomical differences might suggest there may be some functional differences as well. And we know from multiple lines of evidence, which um, you probably uh, don't need me to explain, that the anterior cingulate cortex uh, is implicated in depression, uh, particularly overactivity in some of the subgenual regions uh, has been seen in people with depression and treatment resistant depression, and also in the induction of sadness in healthy volunteers. And there's uh, quite a lot of interesting evidence to suggest that ketamine modulates activity within the anterior cingulate cortex in both healthy controls and in people with depression. And in some cases, these changes can correlate with improvements in depressive symptoms. However, I guess part of the problem is that the functional changes occur at multiple different loci within the anterior cingulate cortex. There's not actually a... Um, huge degree of consistency about the specific regions that are affected. And to date, or prior to this study that we carried out, there hadn't been uh, a single study uh, that compared ketamine's modulation of all the different ACC subregions uh, in the context of a uh, clinical trial. So really what we aimed to do was compare the effects of ketamine compared to placebo on resting state functional connectivity measured using uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging on the different ACC subregions, as I described before, subgenual, perigenual, and dorsal, in people with depression versus healthy volunteers. And the comparison with healthy volunteers is particularly important because ketamine uh, may be uh, normalizing activity in some of these regions to uh, levels of activity seen uh, in healthy volunteers, and that's kind of what we wanted to test. So onto the uh, methods, I'll just turn off my laser pointer for now if I can manage. Um, 
So all of this work was carried out uh, as a secondary analysis of a double blind, randomized, placebo controlled uh, crossover trial, which was uh, carried out in the uh, United States. And the population of interest were individuals with treatment resistant uh, depression, which in this case was uh, defined actually as a fail failure of one uh, treatment of adequate duration and a dose. However, the vast majority of patients had failed many more trials than, than that. Uh, and then 21 healthy volunteers who had no uh, psychiatric conditions uh, or no past psychiatric history. And uh, the intervention, intervention of interest was uh, an intravenous infusion of ketamine, uh, 0.5 milligrams per kilogram over 40 minutes. And then the comparator was uh, intravenous saline, uh, again, administered over 40 minutes. And the outcomes of interest are kind of twofold. So there were the clinical scores and also the resting state um, fMRI changes. And at the bottom, you can see a schematic of the clinical trial. Participants were randomized and then um, had intravenous ketamine or intravenous saline. And the time point of interest here was uh, two days after the ketamine or the saline was administered. So scores were taken two days afterwards and imaging was done uh, two days afterwards as well, uh, resting state fMRI. And then there was a two week washout period and then participants were crossed over to receive the um, opposite manipulation. And to just quickly summarize the clinical scores that we looked at, we looked at uh, depression scores. So uh, Mon Montgomery Asperger depression rating scales and then we also looked at anhedonia scores. Now, unfortunately, the anhedonia scores were only measured in a subset of participants. Um, the anhedonia scores that we took were the Smith-Hamilton pleasure scale and also the temporal experience of pleasure scale, uh, anticipatory and consummatory scales. And the reason, the reason for this is primarily because anhedonia isn't a unitary construct and thoughts are that anhedonia can be separated into distinct subcomponents. So for example, uh, anticipatory, which might be more Pavlovian, which are, um, you know, the responses in advance of reward, consummatory, which might be to do more with uh, hedonics, and uh, also motivational elements of anhedonia as well. The SHAPS uh, splits questions into kind of different domains, which don't really reflect the temporal aspects of anhedonia. And that's why the TEP scale is quite useful because there are suggestions that neurobiologically anticipatory and consummatory aspects of reward processing um, are mediated by uh, different brain regions. So that, that's the clinical scores. Then in terms of the image imaging changes, uh, we did resting state functional magnetic resonance imaging. It was a eight minute uh, sequence and we looked at changes in functional connectivity, I kind of correlated patterns of bold signals from the different regions of interest, the three ACC regions of interest to the whole brain. So it's an ROI to whole brain analysis. And then what we could then do is correlate changes in functional connectivity with any significant regions to changes in symptom scores and therefore get at whether any of these imaging changes are in some ways um, clinically relevant. The images were uh, pre-processed at the NIMH and using sort of standard standard uh, protocols, motion was regressed out, the images were denoised and bandpass filtered. And then the group level data were analysed using uh, AFNI, Analysis of Functional Neuroimages, and we, as I said previously, primarily did an ROI to whole brain analysis that was um, cluster thresholded uh, with a voxel wise um, p value uncorrected of less than 0 0.001. So the um, images that I will show you subsequently are, are cluster thresholded. So these are the regions of interest shown uh, pictorially on a medial view of the uh, human brain at the top um, and then a coronal view uh, at the bottom. So we had the a subgenual ROI, a perigenual ROI and a, a dorsal ROI as well. Uh, and in brackets, the Brodmann areas that these regions uh, roughly correspond to. 
these ROIs were chosen uh, based on a previous study uh, showing changes in ACC activity associated with uh, depressive rumination. And uh, just to show you that the different ROIs, although in, in particularly the case of the subgenual and the perigenual were quite close together, showed actually quite substantial uh, differences in their functional connectivity to other regions of the brain. So the titles uh, show the different comparisons, and in the top left is just a main effect of region across all the three uh, ROIs. And in red in each of the images are um, suggests that functional connectivity is higher in the former region. So subgenual, for example, showed typically higher patterns of functional connectivity, higher functional connectivity to limbic regions of the brain. So for example, um, the ventral striatum and uh, ventral medial prefrontal cortex. The perigenual anterior cingulate cortex showed actually quite substantial uh, functional connectivity to the posterior cingulate, which is in line with its um, role in um, the default mode network. And then the um, dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, which is only in blue actually, uh, showed at higher strengths of connectivity to uh, areas like the thalamus and the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex and uh, the mid cingulate cortex. The main statistical model was looking at group by treatment by region interaction, group being the depressed or healthy volunteers, treatment being ketamine or placebo, and then the regions having three levels, which was subgenual, perigenual, or dorsal. So that was the kind of main uh, statistical model. There was also effects of order, um, either, either ketamine first or second, and then a random effect of subject. And then we did post hoc tests to look at the group by treatment interaction within each ROI separately. And then also we looked at an effect of treatment, i.e. ketamine versus placebo, within the depressed group alone in each region separately. And that analysis um, was really chosen to correlate with symptom scores in particular, because I guess this change in symptom scores might be most, sorry, excuse me, most relevant in the uh, TRD group rather than in the healthy volunteers. So onto the results, I feel like I've been wittering on, so getting to the sort of meat, the meat of it. Um, this is a table showing the uh, demographics and clinical scores of the uh, people who participated in the trial and plus or minus reflects a standard deviation. So you can see that the individuals with TRD had been, uh, had had a, generally speaking, quite a, lo a long episode. Um, they had several failed treatments and um, they had a long length of illness in total. And uh, they had high MADRAS scores and uh, high SHAP scores and low TEP scores. So in the TEPS scale, Lower scores reflect worse reflect worse anhedonia. So as I said, the results are split into two parts: the clinical and the um, imaging. So just to show you from a clinical point of view, um, the ketamine seemed to work. So on the x-axis we have placebo and ketamine. On the y-axis we have the scores: uh, Madras, Shaps, and Teps. And uh, you can see that ketamine significantly improved the uh, Madras scores at day two post infusion. There was a trend to improve the SHAP scores, and then there were also improvements in the both scales of the uh, TEPs. However, I, I stress that these anhedonia scores were only measured in a subset of approximately uh, 15, 15 patients. Now, looking at the imaging, um, so, ah, oh, sorry, I can't see the title of this, this thing, but at the top, it's just hidden by my Zoom thing. But this, um, what I'm going to show you next is the group by treatment, um, by region interaction. And so this is the result of the main statistical model. And we found two regions that showed significant group by treatment by region interactions, the right insula and the right ventromedial prefrontal cortex, oh, sorry, the bilateral ventromedial prefrontal cortex. And it's a little bit tricky, I guess, to get your head around, but effectively in these regions, what was happening was the functional connectivity in TRD in the case of ketamine, looked similar to the functional connectivity of healthy volunteers in the case of placebo. And you can kind of see that from these uh, graphs, which show the mean Z score across the whole cohort for the different regions on the X axis. 
And you can see, for example, in the case of the subgenual to the right insula, uh, ketamine in TRD was kind of normalizing things to um, healthy volunteers placebo functional connectivity. And then it's particularly actually the case uh, in uh, connectivity to the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. So you can see the same sort of thing that TRD ketamine um, looks relatively similar to uh, a healthy volunteer placebo. And we correlated um, these the changes in functional connectivity with changes in symptom scores. And the perigenual ROI to right insular functional connectivity changes correlated with um, improvements in MADRA score. So you can see the change in MADRA score on the X, that's ketamine minus placebo, and the change in uh, perigenual to right insular connectivity on the Y. And uh, in general, ketamine tended to produce um, perigenual connectivity to the right insular. And you can see that this correlated with um, the change in MADRA score across the cohort. Now, what I'm showing you here is one of the post hoc analyses. So this is a group by treatment uh, interaction within each region separately. Firstly, the subgenual. Uh, so in yellow are the TRD, and in gray are healthy volunteers. On the x axis, you've got the manipulation, and on the y axis, you've got the connectivity score, and the dots re represent individual subjects. And there were significant interactions between SGACC and the right hippocampus, extending partially into the parahippocampal gyrus. And then also a similar uh, region of ventral medial prefrontal cortex that uh, I showed you previously. The perigenual uh, showed significant changes, uh, significant interaction with the posterior cingulate cortex, uh, perhaps in line with its kind of known connectivity to nodes of the default no mode network. And then the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex showed uh, significant interaction um, with the left uh, supramarginal gyrus. And the DACC is kind of in a thought to be in a slightly different network from the more ventral regions. So somatosensory attention network rather than kind of the limbic default mode regions of the ventral ACC. And um, finally, what I'm showing you here is the effect of treatment within the um, region separately within the TRD group alone. Perhaps starting at the bottom, um, within the TRD group, there were no significant changes in the perigenual and the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. It was the subgenual ACC that showed the most substantial changes within the um, within the depressed group, and ketamine tended to increase connectivity between the subgenual and perigenual. It's a slightly different region compared to the ROI. The ventromedial PFC, which we showed previously, a very similar area. The uh, right ventral striatum is kind of ventral putamen, and then uh, the right hippocampus and parahippocampal gyrus. What we then did was we correlated uh, these changes with uh, improvements in symptoms, and none of the regions showed significant correlations with improvements in MADRA scores compared to the previous perigenual right insular correlation. However, the subgenual changes in functional connectivity to the perigenual um, correlated with improvements in uh, SHAP scores, so one of the anhedonia measures. So on the x-axis here, we've got change in SHAP scores, to the left is improving, on the y-axis, we've got the change in connectivity, and you can see that there was a significant correlation, i.e. bigger increases in functional connectivity led to bigger improvements in anhedonia scores. And then, interestingly, when we looked at the correlation with ventral striatum, there was a trend to correlate with CHAP scores, but um, the correlation was significant. I stress it's in a very small sample size. It's 11 subjects now because not all subjects had all the scans. Um, there was a correlation between improving anticipatory anhedonia scores and increases in subgenual to ventral striatal connectivity, which um, is interesting, as I'll explain soon. Um, I think uh, I'll briefly touch on this. this um, the, there's a problem with correlating symptom scores with um, clusters identified in imaging analysis because the clusters were identified using... Um, factors which differentiate between the groups and the scores are already different between the groups. So there's a kind of bias involved in that analysis. So one way of doing an unbiased analysis is to do whole brain regressions of the symptom scores. So what you can do is you can look at your subgenual, in this case, we picked subgenual because that showed the most substantial anhedonia changes. You look at your subgenual functional connectivity maps and you regress the changes in symptom scores and you ask whether any connectivity to any of the brain regions 
um, correlates with uh, anhedonia scores. And initially we looked at a treatment by score interaction focusing on the SHAP. So is there a different pattern uh, under the placebo condition versus the ketamine condition? And we found that there was a cluster within the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex that showed increased connectivity in the case of ketamine, which correlated with better anhedonia scores, but de decreased co connectivity um, under placebo correlated with better anhedonia scores. And then what we did was we controlled changes in connectivity under the ketamine uh, scan um, by using changes in connectivity in the placebo scan. And you can see that um, a slightly separate cluster within the dorsal anterior cingulate, kind of extending into mid-cingulate cortex, correlated with uh, better anhedonia scores at day two post-ketamine. So sorry for yeah, perhaps being a bit too long, but uh, just on some interpretation conclusions. So the question we really have is, does ketamine differentially modulate ACC subregions compared to placebo in TRD versus healthy volunteers? And I think what we've shown is the answer uh, suggested by the study is yes. And this is kind of a bit of a stream of consciousness now about different interpretations. But firstly, uh, what I'd like to suggest is that these data are broadly consistent with what we know about the involvement of different ATC subregions and different brain networks. So the more ventral regions, subgenual and perigenual, perigenual, sorry, linked to effective and default mode network regions, whereas the DATC is more involved in salient somatosensory and attention networks. And the interactions we show within the individual regions themselves are entirely consistent with that. Now, there are various um, different suggestions about how the subgenual might be involved in symptoms of depression. And one um, theory is that the subgenual is excessively connected to the default mode network and the negative affect laden behavioral withdrawal Med thought to be mediated by the subgenual anterior cingulate cortex when aberrantly linked to the default mode network might underlie um, ruminative thinking. And in our study, we showed that actually uh, ketamine modulates subgenual connectivity to the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, to uh, the medial temporal lobe, so the hippocampus and the parahippocampal gyrus, which may be consistent with ketamine uh, modulating SGACC to default mode network connectivity. Um, consistent with this with this suggestion. More recently, um, there was a paper published in 2023 uh, suggesting that the um, subgenual anterior cingulate cortex, particularly Brobrin area 25, um, is involved in behavioral withdrawal and low mood, and that this is normally inhibited by higher cortical regions. And uh, indeed, we show in this paper that ketamine um, increases connectivity between perigenual and ventromedial, they overlap with Brodmann area 10 uh, regions, and that change in connectivity between subgenual and perigenual correlated with improvements in anhedonia. So it might be that ketamine is restoring top-down inhibition uh, of the subgenual uh, by these higher, um, well, higher is kind of a, a weird word, but these are, yeah, higher cortical regions. Um, Separately, uh, Amy Arnston of colleagues have suggested that the subgenual is part of an emotional pain circuit and that um, when pain is processed in the brain, there are parallel pathways, somatosensory pain and emotional aspects of pain and the emotional aspects of pain are mediated by medial structures in the insular cortex. And obviously in this study, again, we find that the um, subgenual ACC connectivity to regions such as the DACC and insular cortex are modulated by ketamine. Uh, and so this may be relevant to uh, the emotional aspects of uh, pain and mental anguish. Um, in this paper in 2015, they suggest that the ultra rapid effects of intranasal ketamine are um, due to a more direct effect in the ventromedial PFC, PFC through the crib reform plates. Uh, but I think this is uh, quite speculative. And my PhD, actually, we were looking at the role of the subgenual anterior cingulate cortex in reward processing and threat arousal in marmosets. And what we did was we overactivated the subgenual using uh, infusions of pharmacological uh, drugs um, through cannula in marmosets. And we did PET imaging. And we showed that when you overactivate the subgenual, it activates and inactivates various brain regions 
involved in um, reward processing and in threat arousal, depending on the context in which it's activated. And that actually ketamine could reverse some of these imaging changes. And the regions that were implicated in these studies are uh, actually very analogous to the ones we've seen in this human study. And particularly interesting, uh, interestingly, uh, subsequent yet work using DREADS, which are designer receptors exclusively activated by designer drugs. So these are G-protein coupled receptors that can be um, infused in a surgical procedure into regions of the brain. Um, the GPCRs are expressed and they respond to a ligand, uh, which can be given uh, peripherally that's otherwise inert, but acts on those receptors and therefore can activate specific pathways in the brain. When you uh, inject the ligands into uh, the nucleus accumbens of monkeys that have had the dread in the subgenual ACC, uh, it can induce anhedonia. So overactivating pathways from subgenual to nucleus accumbens can induce anhedonia. And that when ketamine is actually infused into the nucleus accumbens, it blocks um, those anhedonic-like symptoms. And again, this is analogous to what we found um, here, in a sense, in that ketamine was modulating subgenual to accumbens or ventral striatal uh, activity. So, uh, yeah, sorry, that's a bit of a stream of consciousness about some of the potential theories about how this, how these data may be, may be um, maybe how they, what these data mean and how they may back translate to animal literature. Um, just some limitations. Uh, it's a small sample size, especially when we were correlating some of the connectivity changes with the anhedonia scores. It was, um, we couldn't do, for example, uh, leave one out cross validation because the sample size was too small. Um, it was a fixed time point that was analyzed in this particular study and the um, integrity of the blinds for school raters was assessed in the initial trial, but not for participants. So there's um, absolutely a possibility of unblinding. Um, so I'd just like to uh, thank you for listening and uh, acknowledge um, Professor Mithil Mehta uh, in, in particular, who was um, the supervisor at King's College London, and Professor Carla Serrate, who was the supervisor at NIMH, and Pete, Dr. Pete Hawkins and Jennifer Evans, uh, who uh, really assisted with this analysis and the write-up of the paper. And that's a reference for the main paper and just re other references. Um, yeah, that's everything. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Leith. It was like a um, great overview of your paper and also some possible interpretation of the data we can really tell that you're quite passionate about this brain area specifically yeah yeah i i really think so this is kind of going a bit off topic but um <laughs> i really th i really think these evolutionary sort of ancient areas of the brain are probably very very important in mediating well mediating some of the vegetative aspects of depression and then mediating the kind of um withdrawal and um i think you know I think animals can get depressed. And so it's probably me a lot of the kind of core symptoms are mediated by these very ancient structures in the brain. I mean, all bits of the brain, I guess, are a bit evolutionary ancient, but but particularly these like limbic regions are obviously uh, very important. So that's why um, when I was st studying stuff in animals, uh, I could see the effects of manipulating activities in these anterior cingulate regions, and they were quite profound. Um, so yeah, I do I do think they're critical. And I guess there's not right now one coherent interpretation, but there are lots of bits of evidence that are pointing in a similar direction, if that makes sense, which I think is quite exciting and suggests we might be getting a bit closer to understanding what's going on, but maybe I'm just naive and optimistic. I'm only 30, so. <laughs> but still. I think one we does. have some question in the chat. Um, yeah. Um, so Rupert is, is one of those, uh, asking if you can say something about the evolution of these areas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, these areas, as I said, are evolutionary ancient. Should I stop sharing my screen, by the way? Uh, is that useful? I can stop sharing my screen. Um, yeah, hopefully that stopped. Um, yeah, they're evolutionary ancient. They're agranular. So the anterior cingular is uh, a granular cortex, uh, which is uh, old phylogenetically, uh, phylogenetically, and um, 
there are equivalents of these anterior cingulate cortical regions in rodents. So again, I didn't really touch on the rodent literature here, but the homologue of the subgenual ACC area 25 in particular is the infralimbic cortex. And the homologue of the perigenual ACC area 32 is the prelimbic cortex, although there are some inconsistencies in sort of functional analogy. But um, again, there's quite a substantial amount of data that suggests that ketamine modulates infralimbic and prelimbic cortex in rodents. And that if you, for example, optogenetically activate uh, pathways from the infralimbic cortex to the hippocampus, for example, you can recapitulate some of the rapid antidepressant effects of ketamine. Um, in my PhD, we were looking at marmosets, and marmosets have a relatively, um, they have a large Bobbin area 25, which is amenable to surgical targeting. And um, they have a more well-developed uh, granular prefrontal cortex. And so when you're studying interactions between these ACC regions and the rest of the PSC, they're a useful model organism. Um, yeah, I hope, hope that's useful. There's actually quite a good paper which I can send around looking at evolution of the PSC that was published quite recently. Um, but yeah. And uh, Liz, I have some um, question about the paper. If you, if you don't mind but then of course any question is very much welcome so you can just like uh if you feel brave enough uh just like ask the question yourself or you can just like pop something in the chat and we will read it uh but while uh people are gathering their thoughts i thought uh do you have any idea if uh or any suspect or any i don't know uh thought about the fact that maybe there could have been like an effect of the order of treatment or any thoughts of like there could have been like some carryover effect uh, if they were like randomized to ketamine first uh, compared to placebo? Did, did you check, for example, if they relapsed? Because you said like the time where it were set um, in terms of the imaging two days after the infusion, but I don't know. It were two weeks apart, if not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. So there is, I mean, yeah. That, so there was a two week washout period, which obviously is 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 I guess reasonably long, but probably not necessarily long enough to ensure that all the effects of, for example, the ketamine in those who had ketamine first were washed out. Um, we did in the main statistical analysis look uh, for an effective order, and there was no main effective order, and we also looked at a oh gosh, what do we look at? We looked at a group by order interaction. So that was kind of get so that was trying to get at well perhaps if the depressed patients had ketamine first they would be disappointed uh, sorry they would if they had placebo force they might be disappointed might be disappointed um, and you know di different like carryover effects based on whether the depressed or the control group had ketamine or placebo first and basically we didn't show a group by order interaction either so. Based on those analysis, there wasn't any functional imaging effect of treatment order. Um, yeah. I think we have another question from Rupert in the chat, if you want to read it out. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, was the effect of ketamine on depression as big as you expected? It didn't seem as big as I was expecting. Um, so yeah, I, I, it wasn't as big as I expected, to be honest. I think I'm, again, probably coming at it from a bit of a naive standpoint. This was the first sort of clinical trial data that I had looked at for ketamine. All my work previously had been in animal literature, and I think I had a bit of a blinkered view about how, how effective ketamine would be. I mean, bearing in mind that these are very tr treatment-resistant patients who had failed multiple treatments. Um, but yeah, not many people, certainly not many people are in uh, would be classified as re remitters. And actually not many people, If we, I think it was classified in the original trials as um, response was a greater than 50% reduction. Not many people responded, really. So yeah, it was actually um, a little bit surprising to me. Um, yeah. It just submitted, I think, from, from your um, sample, that, like, they were fairly young, right? Yes, yeah, they were they were fairly young. Yeah, I don't know if that's uh, people have found that that's um, changes the response or not. But yeah, they were they were they were fairly young. It's like they they're uh, um, I think mean age was in their thirties, right? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it was about yeah mid thirties from from memory. Yeah. Um, and um, I think we have another question in the chat. Yeah, yeah. Um, are there any links between ACC and lateral habenula? Um, yes, I'm pretty sure there are, and um, the I know that there's been suggestion, particularly in um, preclinical. Uh, studies that the lateral habenula might be causally involved in the um, antidepressant effects of uh, ketamine. Um, off the top of my head, I don't, I can't remember if there are any sort of um, anatomical studies that look at whether there's any direct connectivity between the lateral habenula and um, the ACC subregions. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not too sure. Um, I think from what I understand from some of the animal work, though, that there are um, some of the subregions of the ACC do do connect it possibly indirectly to the lateral venula. Um, but yeah, we didn't we didn't see any effect on the lateral venula here. I wonder if anybody else on this call knows anything about about that, whether they anyone can chip in with that. Um, or, or is it the sort of thing where people, um, you know, you tend to fall into one camp or the other, and you know, if you're, you know, if you're looking for particular links, you know, it's something that depends on on what your prior prior sort of hypotheses are. Yeah, I was just actually having a look because, um, uh, so yeah, both SGACC twenty five and PGACC next year are known to project the lateral habenula. Um, Several preclinical, I'm just reading from uh, one of the review articles, several preclinical studies have demonstrated that there is a complex interplay between lateral venula and ACC, jointly mediating decision-making behavioral adjustments during learning. For instance, during a reversal learning task, neuronal activity within macaque lateral venula and the perigenual ACC correlates with behavioral adjustments after a no reward outcome. It's like, I guess, kind of almost like a punishment outcome. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so the probably is. Probably yeah, is you always have to bear in mind that the habenula is very small, very deep yeah. into the brain, so definitely quite difficult to uh, to check, you know, in terms of functional connectivity. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I don't know where if this this work kind of seventy. Oh, we'll see like um, has a question, maybe. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Good to see everyone. Um. So yeah, I have a question just about some of the results because. I'm a bit confused, honestly, yeah. um, just about some of the directionality of the findings. And so I think you said that ketamine seemed to increase BA25 connectivity with like the NPFC and NAC and reduce it with hippocampus and some were associated with improvement in symptom, but that was kind of the directionality. Um, but then also you mentioned that sort of like higher connectivity between subgenual and VMPFC and default mode is associated with rumination and and then also the subgenual high connectivity with accumbens associated with blunted reward processing. And then also you mentioned that with the hippocampus direction, that's associated with the, the opposite directions associated with the antidepressant effects in those dread studies. So it seemed, unless I'm misreading, it so, seems to be going in the opposite direction from, from what you might expect from the literature. It, 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 am I reading yeah. it right? No, it is, it is. The directionality is confusing. The directionality is confusing. I suppose um, because, so for example, like increases in connectivity between, you might correct me here, but like increases in connectivity between subgenual and perigenual, it's hard to know whether that reflects um, excitatory inputs or whether that reflects um, changes to like top down inhibition. So, for example, like perigenual pyramidal cells can't taxing onto inhibitory interneurons in those regions and then inhibiting. So yeah, it's, it, I think that's part of the difficulty, I guess, with these fMRI studies is that you, the directionality of the functional connectivity change can be slightly difficult to interpret. Um, the, the way that I was seeing it is possibly, yeah, it reflects a restoration of top-down inhibition, for example, between the MPFC and SGACC and PGACC and SGACC. Um, but 
yeah it's hard to say for sure yeah yeah at least with that change in like um area 25 hippocampus connectivity yeah. that's like kind of consistent with some other work but then there was this sort of more direct study where they they increased the connectivity of dreads like that's very direct and that yeah. that was you know that supported the antidepressant effect so maybe it maybe it's specific region based and it's just part of the hippocampus and but it's it's nothing's really coming together in the same direction it's a bit weird yeah 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 it is, it is. I, I think this is where also uh, you know the animal studies are probably very important because there is a ability to establish causality um so yeah i but i agree with you i agree with you it's it's the directionality is kind of a bit confusing this is what i'm saying this from this study alone i don't think there's obviously a one story that kind of fits but it does in a way i'm encouraged that it's kind of implicating the same regions and some of the changes in uh, correlate with symptom improvement so I'm pretty sure these regions are important, but the full um, clean picture, I don't think is is there yet. Yeah, no, it's really impressive work and important, and it's still kind of a nascent field, the neural effects of ketamine, so. Yeah. Um, and it's thank you. Yeah, sorry, it's okay. Um, it's fascinating that, you know, it's the same singular regions are implicated in predicting antidepressant effects in other modalities and that's just, that's just so fascinating the, these regions must be important they must be important and the other the other thing that i i find very interesting is like these sub particularly this ventral region of the acc are intimately connected to regions of the brainstem that regulate cardiovascular function and to the hypothalamus um and my initial in during the phd was actually i was interested in the link between cardiovascular disease and depression and we found that when you change activity in these regions um the cardiovascular physiology in primates changed quite substantially so that is also fascinating as well but yeah it's just i don't think the full picture is clear right now yeah so i'm very excitable about this sort of stuff but then i also wonder if it can also has to do you know you you had a small sample size yeah and um and also you didn't have um you know you weren't able to, to, to see like who are the responders who are not and, and overall they didn't really respond yeah uh, it, no it could be it was like a 48 hours while like traditional like these work is done at 24 hours yeah yeah i yeah it, it's it was interesting why um i did discuss actually with them with the um group at the nimh why it was 48 hours and I, I have to confess I can't remember what their reasoning was um but yeah it's quite odd it's quite I thought that was I thought that was quite an odd um choice of time points um but yeah yeah and it's also part of the problem with the field I guess is that there are multiple different time points and they're chosen which can kind of complicate uh interpretation um there's not really yeah huge amount of consistency when, for example, I was reviewing some of the neuroimaging literature, lots of them are published at various different time points. So that complicates things further, I think. Well, you had a crossover design, though, that like, in, at least in terms of the sample size, help a bit. Yeah, uh, yeah. So that's right. But um, you also didn't have a sort of baseline, right, scan. Yeah, well, so so they did so they did have um they did have a baseline um fMRI scan. Yeah, yeah, we didn't include it in this analysis, but they they did have a baseline um scan as well. But but in the in the paper that you showed us, were basically just post intervention, either post ketamine or yeah. post. They get this yeah. right. It, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, they were the scans that we included in the analysis. I thought also I, th I think you you showed us uh, one of the um, figure it's figure two in in your article that I'm thinking of, and uh, when you look at the group for treatment for regional uh, interaction at the level of the intramedial PFC, uh, the the TRD um, look very different at the level of the subgeneral singlet uh, in the two groups like the placebo and the ketamine. Like yeah, 
Yeah, I think I remember that one sec. Let me have a look. Um Yes, yeah, yeah. It was it was very it was very different in the TRD group. Again, I go, yeah, can you interpret this as like, because but, but that bit of the VMPFC that's highlighted is kind of Broadman Area 10. Mm -hmm. And um, Broadman Area 10 is in, so a lot of um, Helen Barbas's work, like track tracing work in uh, monkeys, is like very uh, he heavily projects to the subgenual ACC. And um, I suppose at a kind of basic level that could reflect could fit with this top-down inhibition story um so ba10 and ba32 are thought to um inhibit activity within the subgenual and these projections are particularly sensitive to the effects of chronic stress in depression so if you're chronically stressed those um connections are weakened and perhaps ketamine is restoring a degree of that top-down inhibition it's a bit yeah i guess it's a bit of a simplistic way of looking at it but but the data here would would fit with that and um again if anybody has any question please just feel free to, to jump in but um if i um I'm just like ask another one, right? In in your paper, you focus a lot on, and of course, the Madras is sort of like asymptom severity, and then on anhedonia, right? The shafts and and the taps and different um, construct of anticipatory and consumatory anhedonia. Uh, but I think you also mentioned the, the rumination, and I wonder. I mean, I, I get that you analyzed data that were already um, collected as part of a clinical trial, but do you think that maybe this kind of analysis would fit better, um, focusing more on the ruminative? thoughts yeah. and be improved with ketamine definitely yeah we didn't have a measure of rumination so uh, i think that's i should really probably include that as another limitation because that was one of um my main interests when i was going into looking at the data was the kind of rumination default mode subgenual thing and we yeah, unfortunately we didn't have a measure of rumination um you know, I guess it would be, it would be really interesting. It would have been really interesting to look at whether any of these functional connectivity changes correlated with improvements in rumination, um, in symptoms of rumination. But yeah, unfortunately, it didn't didn't have access to that. Um, particularly, uh, yeah. Sorry, go on. Go on. There may be, there may be, uh, I mean, it's not uh, it's not exactly the same the same thing as a rumination scale, but. Um, I thought I was wondering if you thought to just like maybe look at some items of the Madras, like maybe the one more focused on the pessimism or pessimistic thoughts. Oh, yeah, yeah that's closer to that question you're wondering about. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. I've not 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 done that actually. Um, but we do have the uh sub elements of the Madras in the participants, so yeah, it might be possible to look at that. It might. I think it's it's. There is something like along like pessimistic thoughts. So it's not it's not exactly the same thing, but yeah, along the instrument you have maybe it's, it's coming a bit a bit closer. And and I was also wondering if you have any data available on the dissociation or how dissociate they were throughout the experience that can also like inform you a bit about the blinding or or just in general how intense the experience was for them that maybe can explain also this this difference. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure off the top of my head, but I'm pretty uh, I'm not sure. So I know that they collected that data, the um CADS scores. Um, but I don't know what they showed off the top of my head. Um and yeah, we did we didn't look at it in this in this analysis. Um I know that it's quite a sort of debated topic whether the degree of dissociation correlates or is, is kind of important in the subsequent antidepressant or uh, anti-anhedonic effects but um yeah i have to confess i'm not sure what it showed in this study the the, the references for the original trial are in the paper itself um so um there's one in biological psychiatry and one in molecular psychiatry so if they were collected and um, they would be they would be there I also wonder if somebody has any other question. Can I ask a really stupid question? Um, is is there? A, I mean, what what you've shown is a sort of cortical um, uh, functional connectivity. What what's the sort of relationship between um, monoaminergic systems, in particular serotonergic systems, and 
and the um, subgenual cortex? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So um, the subgenual anterior cingulate cortex has quite high um, concentrations of, well, it shows high expression patterns of um, 5-HT2A uh, receptors. It also, also interestingly, has um, of many cortical regions, some of the highest expression of NR2B, um, NMDA subunit expression. Um, many monoaminergic antidepressants, there's se several, I think actually some of it comes from Catherine Harmer's group, showing that like um, some of these SSRIs modulate activity in these regions. And um, yeah, uh, these brain regions are do show like high exp high expression levels of serotonin serotonin receptors interestingly also kappa opioid receptors are highly expressed in the subgenual and that's thought to which, be which which ones sorry kappa opioid receptors mm -hmm. are particularly highly expressed in subgenual ACC so um you know thought to mediate perhaps the dysphoric effects of opioids and um acted on by uh, dynorphin so yes um lots of serotonin receptors 5-HT2A in particular in the subgenual. Can you see any immediate, I mean, this is a terrible question to ask, I know, but yeah, okay. you see any, can you see any sort of way in which these sorts of insights could could be developed in, in um, you know, if they were replicated and so forth, could be developed in a way that would enhance treatment? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, I guess. Uh, I know that's not the point, but no, 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 yeah. no. I mean, ultimately, that would be ideal. Um, and it comes to the heart of the problem of not using sort of functional imaging in in clinical practice. Really, um, I think that what so what these results might suggest is that. Firstly, different brain regions are involved in, so the anhedonia aspect of it, different brain regions are involved in temporally distinct um, types of anhedonia. And it might be that when we look at reward processing deficits, we need to be better classify those and better understand the subtyping because they may be mediated by different brain circuits and they may be differentially responsive to treatment. So, for example, we show that in, in this case, um, the improvements in anticipatory anhedonia correlate with change in subgenual to ventral striatal uh, connectivity. Um, oh, it, is it clinically relevant? I don't know. It's just, I guess, cause for better subtyping of symptoms, uh, perhaps. Um, I mean, these the subgenual is a target in deep brain stimulation uh, for depression. And so um, I guess uh, these data support that rapid acting antidepressant effects can be mediated by changes in subgenual connectivity to other brain regions. Um, so support the idea that it's possibly a very important target in depression. Um, what I would have really liked to do is try and, um, and what we might be able to do looking at the baseline scans is try and see if any of the functional connectivity changes predict um, subsequent antidepressant or anti-anhedonic effects. That would be quite interesting. And um, it also might be the case that um, connectivity between the subgenital and the dorsal anterior cingulate, which I showed as one of the final analyses, um, might be a useful um, measure to try and understand who might show higher or lower anhedonia scores after ketamine treatment. I think it's still quite a far away from um, clinical application, but... Cool. Yeah. Question, <laughs> no, it's okay. It's difficult to answer. Um, because yeah, it's, I still think there's quite a gulf between yeah, applying it to the clinic. All right. Oh, Chia, you, you have a question. Uh, for late. please go ahead. Um, I'd like to ask um your opinion about um. Uh, future studies possibly where the subjects may not only be those who are showing treatment resistance, but is there any validity, usefulness to um, trying it on patients who are at the earliest stage and haven't had, you know, multiple years of other kinds of antidepressant um, treatments to see whether the history 
of the other treatments uh, are interacting in any way with ketamine? Yeah, that's, um, I think that's an interesting question. I guess uh, there are there are practical reasons why ketamine is not used as a first line, right, um, in the treatment of depression. But from a research perspective, um, I, I think that would be very interesting. I should say that the in this study, the TRD patients were were medication free. Um, so that's a strength, I guess, um, of this study. They had been medication free for at least two weeks and I think a bit longer for fluoxetine. And if they were for example, receiving aripiprazole, I think augmentation, they were they were medication free for a bit longer as well of the aripiprazole. Um, but yeah, they had had multiple episodes of depression and been treated with multiple different antidepressants on the, in general. Um, whether ketamine would have any different effects neurobiologically if it was in people who were naive to treat with other antidepressants. So I, I guess it's certainly possible. Um, but yeah, uh, and, you know, interestingly, in the animal studies, I mean, we were giving when we were treating marmosets with ketamine to see if it reversed any of the brain changes, they had not received any serotonergic antidepressants or anything like that. They was they were kind of treatment naive and ketamine modulated at subgenual connectivity to lots of the similar brain regions that we've identified here. Um, so, but yeah, could could well be interesting to look at that. Thank you. There is. Well. Thank you very much. We are, we are approaching the end of our hour. So if nobody has any other question, I think maybe we want, can close this here. So like a huge thank you to Leif. It was a great presentation and, and answering all our questions. Um, I guess we'll see you in the new year on January 9th.